topic that 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 might need a bit more sustained uh, discussion, uh, I will then limit the Q and A to that particular topic. So, um, any questions? Start with. Um, sorry, my question basically is more related to the role of the state and the liberal condition of biology that's just been discussed. At the beginning, you mentioned that the state shouldn't play the role of the arbiter of any unifying or underlying common ground values of that particular society. But the fact that the state is imposing certain punishments or arrangements on its people, doesn't that in itself mean that it's carrying out certain defined underlying assumptions about what those values a society should be holding? Um, it is. So if the question is, how should one regard the determinations of the state with respect to a whole range of things, including uh, punishment? Now, what the state will typically want to say is that it is doing what it's doing because this is consistent with the values that um, are there in the society. Now, this is possible, uh, and in fact, in some ways, it can't stray too far from what is um, politically feasible. But the other thing to remember is that the state is an institution that has its own interests. It's not simply a straightforward reflection um, of the values of the society, because the state is made up of people, the people who are uh, associated with the state. It's not just the government, but also the bureaucracy and those who are um, dependent on um, government uh, um, institutions, largesse, and so on. They're all, in a certain way, a part of the state. So the state has its interest because it's got to maintain its own survival. Now, to that extent, many of the things it does reflect that need, not its need or, or its wish to simply serve the values of the community itself. The other thing to bear in mind here, and this is in a sense related, is that the state, even aside from having its own interests, is also the, the site of competition among different interests. If a group has a particular view, whether it's economic um, or ethical, um, may well think, okay, the best way to get what I want is through the state, by agitating, by lobbying, by um, you know, making campaign contributions in order to push a particular agenda. So whichever outcome we see will, to some extent, be a reflection of um, this particular conflict within society. And the outcome is not necessarily evidence of some sort of consensus. It may just be evidence that some particular group has won. Now, this isn't to say that, therefore, you know, we should think that nothing that comes out of the state is legitimate, that none of the laws are valid. But it does mean that just because the state has done something does not mean that it is equally to be regarded as authoritative as a reflection of values of the society as a whole. It's just not necessarily the case. Um, I should ask also that um, if you want your question to be directed to a particular person, do uh, let me know. Because otherwise I will invite the other speakers, <laughs> the other panelists to also offer their views on, on their questions. Yeah, I would like to ask a question to Professor Kukatas. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank you for being with us today. Uh, I've been like, I've been reading your papers and... Uh, He's a fan, actually. So, you have been writing about multiculturalism and... Uh, no, no, your question is another dimension. So, uh, my question is that, uh, how far actually is uh, the, this element of culture in the in you know shaping the view of the public reason uh, in determining whatever that the legitimate step that the state is going to take? Because if we look at uh, the global society, the global order today, uh, we are actually uh, moving in a direction of uh, a global capitalist world system 
uh, which neglects any you know assumption of particular culture which we inherited from the past. So uh, it's like the whole world is you know being uh, engraved in this one particular culture. So uh, what difference can uh, any particular culture which we have inherited from our heritage uh, could you know could um, add on into the debate in the public reason? Okay. I think there's, there's a problem here um, addressing this question through the terminology of culture because when you <coughs> describe the existence of a kind of world culture that underpins global capitalism and when you talk about um, local cultures or national cultures. What you're identifying <coughs> through the use of this word is really, in a way, quite different things. Um, you know, in one case, you're identifying the presuppositions of uh, both economic and political interaction across the world <coughs> by a range of let me just call them economic and political elites. These are the people who do, in fact, you know, crisscross the globe, whether physically or you know, electronically. Uh, you can call that a culture, but it's not necessarily a culture, say, in the same way that you might use the word culture to describe um, a set of practices associated with, say, a religion. And it's not really the same thing as something you might describe using the word culture when you want to identify uh, a particular political ethos. So the word culture is a bit too protean. You know, it's just changing all the time to suit different um, circumstances. But okay, having said that, uh, I think there is a kind of a deep question that you are um, tracking with this intervention. And that is that there seems to be um, a kind of disconnection between international processes, the, the workings of international capital, the, the workings of um, all those people who occupy positions that range from you know, memberships of different UN bodies to memberships of different regimes, whether you're talking about the Refugee Convention or you're talking about various treaties, those people have a particular set of um, values, and I think more importantly, interests, that really are things that they hold in common. Uh, and they are, in a sense, making and adjusting and interpreting rules that affect the whole world. But they're not necessarily rules that, in fact, suit people everywhere or that serve the interests of people everywhere. Uh, even when, or perhaps even especially when, they say they're making these rules and transforming institutions in the interests of everyone. Because, in a sense, this is something that they're not capable of doing. Because you know, um, people who are trying to make their way in the world, to live their life, to you know, make lives for themselves, their families, communities, and so on, uh, are working in mostly their own local circumstances, and these global rules don't necessarily serve um, their interests. The problem then is, well, <coughs> how do we um, address this particular problem? Can this problem be addressed? Because you know, for most um, individuals, all these institutions are really so remote. Um, I, I don't think that um, the way to address it intellectually is by talking about, about culture at this, at this point. I think the way to, uh, to go is to, is to really, in a sense, put aside the issue of culture, which may be useful in some more local context, um, but to address the, the question really more directly in terms of politics. What is the politics that's going on here? Whose interests are being served? Whose interests are being damaged? Um, and then ask, you know, uh, when you're 
looking at whose interests are in play, how do you identify them? Because sometimes you might be identifying individuals, sometimes you might be identifying corporations, sometimes you might be identifying cities. I mean, it's, you know, there are very many kinds of entities. And I think culture doesn't really capture this uh, diversity any more than any one single notion would. Sorry, could I just um, uh, just ask a question? I mean, um, you're saying that you know the best way to address this question is politically, but I wonder whether economically there is a culture that is being created. I, I mean, whether you call it an ideology or a culture, um, you know, a neoliberal ideal that is upheld by a lot of these organisations and the elite, I suppose, throughout the world, and the policies that are being implemented locally are inherently, you know, going to create a neoliberal culture, I suppose you could say. So, for example, if you look at education um, and international development and the policies that are being implemented, for example, in Malaysia, and I, I read the paper recently, it's all very much based on human capital theory and the ideas of human capital theory and education is, you know, for work and so on and so forth. That is a neoliberal culture that is being, I would, I would argue, that is being, uh, that is permeating various societies throughout the world from, I suppose you could say, a central, uh, yeah. central wherever that centre is, um, body somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think I agree with you about the process that you're describing. The reason I'm hesitant to call this, um, say, for example, a, a neoliberal culture is that I think you know, within liberalism, even taking it you know, to be something more than just the very um, minimalist view that, that I advance. There are quite a few different views about what is the purpose of an education. Um, and certainly there are many views that see it not as having, uh, as, its, you know, as its main end, the acquisition of certain kinds of skills to participate in the market economy. Um, but that is, I think you're right, you know, the um, the message in a way that's going to be sent out by any kind of international institution which will be you know, centrally organized and you know, almost invariably manned by an ex-politician. I think right now Gordon Brown is you know, one of the um, you know, uh, leading uh, figures charged with uh, responsibility for a kind of education portfolio through the United Nations. Um, you know, my guess is that one of his motivations, at least, would be to be able to strut across the world stage and be seen to be doing good things. Um, but uh, in, you know, in the end, whether or not um, uh, this is the way to, to go for actual uh, communities is an entirely different matter. So I, I think you and I agree with you about the, the, the main thrust of your remarks. I'd be uh, more... Um, key to say that we should recognize that there are interests in play. Um, but I don't think there's a, there's a single culture that's, that's there. Um, and to the extent that you know, there is, I, I suspect it's much more fluid and variable because it's going to be really a reflection of the membership of that elite rather than some particular um, um, you know, set of values that's um, associated with a particular view about you know, living or a particular um, you know, tradition that comes out of some other specific cultural background. Mm -hmm. I do have a question. I don't know if this... No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, well, I suppose I have a few questions, but I think the one that I want to ask first is, um, going back to the whole discussion on liberalism, um, it seems to me that there is already an assumption that liberal values... Well, OK, so let's define liberalism first. And there's an assumption that liberal values are superior to other values. Um, and uh, my question would therefore be, on what basis do we um, place this uh, on liberalism when I'm not sure that there exists in any society true liberal values? So for example, freedom of speech which I assume is a liberal value, um, I don't know that it exists anywhere, truly, um, uh, because there are always certain ideals or values which are upheld over others. And you know, when we look at the history even of Britain or of what recently happened in France, 
um, there are not many people who can express certain views which are not, you know, uh, which do not conform to the narrative or the discourse of the norm, um, and therefore they may not have the courage to necessarily ex express themselves. And so, therefore, I wonder whether, you know, one can assume that liberal values are superior when we cannot see, when I haven't, when I, you know, my, my question would be, you know, where, where can we see it truly implemented anywhere um, on a total basis? Okay. Um, so the first thing I'd say is that um, in the conception of liberalism that I've uh, advanced, which is a very minimalist view, the, the value being defended in a way is more of a political value than a set of cultural or ethical values. So the claim is essentially, look, there are different values out there. People hold to different values. They debate um, these values. There's no set of agreement on this. In order then for us to, to live together, what we need to do is prescind from our commitments to these particular values that we have and um, take a, a stance that says, okay, what we need to do is to find a way that these values that uh, are out there will coexist. Now, in that respect, liberalism, in a sense, is saying, look, let's not claim that even liberal values are superior. Let's just say uh, there are different values out there in the world, and so uh, let's try and find a way of living together. Um, now, liberals may also have other um, more substantial values of their own, but from the liberal perspective that I'm uh, advancing, the liberal's attitude to his own liberal convictions would be to say, you know, these are some things that are there in the conversation. And if there are groups that want to live differently, then you know, that's up to them. It's not for liberals to tell people how to live. Because in fact, the, the core of liberalism is a kind of view that says, look, you should let them live and let live. You should not use coercion to try to make them live the way you think they should live. Now, um, that brings me then to the second part of your question, really, which is, that, well, is this um, attitude or outlook actually exemplified anywhere in the world? I think in a very broad sense, the kind of view that I'm defending, the very minimalist view, is present in a kind of way to the extent that there is an awful lot of willingness, both within states and across states, to say, look, you know, we're not going to try to enforce one way of living or another. We're just going to accept the fact that there are differences. So there's room in most societies for all kinds of minority positions to, to operate. And so in that sense, there is that liberalism. But in the other sense that you mentioned, uh, when you asked, you know, is there anywhere that you know, liberal values really are protected? And you gave the example of freedom of speech. I think um, there, there are many places where you know, such values are strongly protected. But in every society, any value, I think, is only protected, really, to a limited extent because no value is regarded as something that can trump any other value in any circumstance. No one really thinks that free speech is an absolute value such that no matter what the circumstances, we could never trump it. No one's going to say, look, you know, you can't you know, stop someone's uh, speaking even if it would cause you're allowed to speak and cause massive destruction. No one really thinks that. So the question really is then about what are the, the constraints, what are the interpretations, and so on, of this. Um, in any society where there is free speech in principle, there are always restrictions on speech, whether it's in the form of uh, libel and slander laws, whether it's in the form of restrictions on what you can say, uh, about things that are commercially in confidence, uh, restrictions on what you can do when it comes to patents, and, and so on. So there are all kinds of restrictions on what you can say. Here, the, the answer has got to be actually looking at each case and saying, OK, what is the warrant for restricting something here? Um, and 
and if there isn't you know, a good reason, then ask for stronger protection of that freedom. But if there are some very, very good reasons, then of course you can, you know, um, you can limit any particular freedom of value. Now, in one way, this is an unsatisfactory answer because it says, well, you know, this is it's going to say, well, any government can give an answer and you know, give a justification and then limit speech. Well, of course they can. Um, but the point is here, I think, to say, you know, we're not going to accept just any answer. Okay, we're, we're going to say, when we appeal to freedom of speech, we're going to say, well, no, this is a really important value. So if you're going to limit it, you better give us some very important reasons, but very convincing ones. Whereas there are other values we might say, well, they're not really as significant. So you know, there are many other reasons you might have for limiting them. So I think that's really the, the significance of a value of freedom of speech. It's not that it's an absolute, but it's very, very important. I suppose um, my concern is, um, I mean, based on a recent example, um, I don't know if people are aware of Cage, you know, Arsene Qureshi Cage, who came out to question the uh, the links of, I think, MI5. Right? You know, the suggestion, they came out and suggested that there is a possible link between radicalization and uh, the, um, the activities of uh, MI5. And when that was even suggested, you saw all the establishment ranks close in on an organization like CAGE, who were funded by um, um, funded by the Roundtree Foundation and I think another mm -hmm. one, and they had to, and their funding was uh, taken away, for example, mm -hmm. because of what they were suggesting. Um, and so it seems to me like the notion of freedom of speech um, can only be realised in a society where everyone is totally equal. There is no power, you know. There's no there's no idea of someone who who has a more privileged position compared to others, and everyone has the same level of education. So, you know, where, for example, if someone with that level of power is able to wield that power, you know, this whole society is enlightened enough to argue and say, well, no, we don't want that. But I'm not sure that that, even, that exists, if you understand what I'm trying to say. Am I making sense? Yes, I know, you're making sense, but I, but I don't think you're right. Okay. Um, because I don't think you need society to be completely equal for... Um, some of those um, principles to be instantiable in a society, for there, for there to be freedom of speech, for example. And part of the reason for this is simply that um, having freedom of speech is not um, a kind of fixed quantity, or it's not a threshold concept where you've either got it or you haven't got it. Uh, it's something that you've always got to, to some degree. Uh, and to what degree you've, you've got it is going to depend on a lot of things. Uh, one of the things is going to be the resources you have. The other thing is going to be the, the circumstances that you're operating in. Um, the other things might include you know, your own capacity to articulate what you've, uh, you've got to say. Um, it may also depend upon the, um, you know, the attitudes and outlook of your of your audience, so all of these things can can make a difference to the to the uh, uh, the capacity you have to exercise your speech in an effective way. And of course, one thing that may make a, a great make a difference is that you know you may lament the fact that you've uh, not got you know as much um, capacity through speech to affect things uh, as you would like. But you know maybe you've just got some really bad ideas. I mean, you're struggling to make an impact with uh, the speeches that you're making because no one thinks that what you want to say is, is right. So there can be all kinds of reasons. Um, and so equality is not going to make the difference there. Um, you know, I think many things will make a difference. And I think you're right when you're in thinking that if there are massive inequalities with only a few people with an enormous amount of power, that can be very, very practical. And, deleterious uh, impact on freedom of speech, but you don't need to get all the way to equality to have something that's important. Sure. Now, before I'm going to ask for any more questions, do you guys have any, um, um, anything to share at that point? 
Mon Rio was impressive. Well, I mean, uh, uh, he's only the Rossian, so. Yeah. Uh, any any point of view? It's quite anti-Rossian, so. I, no, I mean, I got I got a question that something along the question of or comment actually. If you look at the developments of the liberalism in the Western world, it comes together with the very strong developments of the civic national identity. When we look at the Malaysia, for instance, we look at the Malaysian uh, political cultural context, we'll, we'll observe that one can, argue, one can argue that actually this cultural identity become one of the main, one of the main kind of the language games that we have in Malaysia. In a sense that uh, our kind of identity that we have to put forward in the political uh, discussions are more centered on culture, cultural identity. In that sense, I mean, what, uh, trying to connect with the, with, the, with the topic on freedom of speech and what are the guidelines at least? Because if we look at Malaysia recently, we have uh, issues on people being arrested for, for seditious and all that, for being uh, for, for, touching, for touching upon a very sensitive issues that touch uh, other cultural concerns, other cultural uh, groups that actually have a, a lot of sensitivities uh, of certain issues. So what are the limits, what are the guidelines for you to actually propose to kind of like set up the the, the, the Restriction for the freedom of speech in that in that sense, I think. So, you, is your question about? Um, I mean, in the context of a, a multicultural society, you know, everybody, everyone's concerned about everyone's over sensitive, over sensitivity, over cultural issues. Uh, freedom of speech is going to be uh, quite limited because uh, once you speak about very sensitive issues, uh, it might lead to chaos. It might lead to actually a kind of a quarrel between the uh, cultural communities. What in that particular context? What are the limitations of freedom of speech that can be applied in Malaysia? For well, to some extent, you can't have freedom of speech unless you've got uh, a society in which there are a lot of people who think it's important that people can speak freely. Now, if you have a society in which for example, um, many people think that you should simply uh, take your cues from the government. Then it's going to be very difficult to defend the idea of free speech because if the attitude is, well, you know, if the government has said so, then it must be right. Then you're going to be you're going to be hard pressed to to defend it. The point I'm trying to move to is to say. Really, ultimately, a lot depends on the ethos of the society. It's not a matter of changing the constitution, or making new laws, or better laws, or formulating things more precisely. It's really what's going on in um, you know, the hearts and minds of people. If the attitude of the population is hostile to any kind of dissent, then it's going to be very difficult. And so I think for those who want to promote greater tolerance, greater freedom of speech, greater capacity to dissent, what they've got to work on is changing not the laws, not the governments, but changing the attitudes of the population at large. Now that's just very difficult. And of course, it's doubly difficult in circumstances where you haven't got freedom of speech. There, there isn't uh, uh, an institutional solution to this problem. Ultimately, I think you know, what makes the difference is actually things like this, where people get together and talk about this, um, and bring other people into the conversation, and try to persuade uh, others that this is something that's actually very important. Part of this may be because these sorts of uh, gatherings and also other forms of investigation do some kind of critical work to identify what's going on and let's say, for example, governments say certain things. For example, if you can say, well, OK, they seem to be saying that you know, what needs to be protected are particular values. But to what extent do those values actually conform in an uncomfortable way and to an uncomfortable extent with their personal interests? Okay? Or to what extent are they being disingenuous or hypocritical? Or um, to what extent are they really just favoring particular interests, even though they're claiming to be defending universal or cultural or relation values? I mean, I think those are the things that, that in the end, uh, are going to have some sort of impact. But, 
how much and how quickly and so on is something you can't really determine. It seems to me that you know, the Malaysia um, of today is quite different in this regard than, say, the Malaysia that I grew up in the 1960s. Uh, there's a very different set of uh, attitudes, not only among the, the political class, but in a sense also among the public. Um, and I think both need to be changed if what you value is something like free speech, if you value freedom of dissent, if you value um, the capacity to, to live independently of um, the demands of the majority or of a ruling elite. But it's all easier said than done. Um, sorry, before that, I'm just going to take this point slightly further. Okay, go ahead. I mean, um, a practical example of my point here is, well, uh, let me start with my point first. Um, this may have actually come up in the discussion beforehand, but I just want to bring out this point a bit more. In, that, in this case, does your conception of liberalism require that there be at least some sort of minimal free speech in a society, without which the society wouldn't be liberal? Um. It does require it, um, because but to even talk about the restrictions on freedom of speech, there has to be some freedom of speech in this. There, there does, but one way of speaking freely is by doing what you're doing right now, which is speaking in London. <laughs> It's not, not ideal. It's outside the society. It's not ideal. But, you know, in the end, you're speaking to other Malaysians, which mm -hmm. are here, but you know, some of them will also be listening if this is publicized in other ways and so on. There are all kinds of ways of, uh, of communicating underneath the radar. Okay? I mean, in, this, in the former Soviet Empire, um, Speech was very, very heavily restricted, so was the publication, and people communicated uh, in person in very, very closed um, private spaces. And political discussion took place not in the squares, but in the kitchens. Publications circulated underground. You couldn't publish and then have your works in the bookstore but people circulated manuscripts uh, from person to person. So there was still, even in those circumstances, a conversation, a dialogue, a discussion. Um, so people could, in some way, communicate. Now, you could find a regime that makes it even more difficult to be North Korea, is a very good example, where it's got such a degree of control of the population. Uh, and such a degree of ferocity in the way it punishes even the slightest deviation, then it makes it very difficult. I think, you know. um, so it's hard to see you know, what mechanism might bring about any kind of change there. But I think you know, it's not that uh, this is impossible even in places where um, the resources are scarce. I'm going off a tangent, but um, I'd just like to know what is your view on the, on the value of values. Um, for example, we've been talking a lot about freedom of speech, and um, I'm not sure if it's an absolute constant everywhere, every time, um, eternal. It's, I'm not sure if it's an eternal truth, because um, the passing of, of um, President Lee Kuan Yew, I mean, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, to remind us that sometimes um, an iron-fisted government might be better for for a particular case. So I'm I'm just want to know what what's your view on the on the value of of our values. Right. Well, I think I indicated earlier that I think there are very few, if any, values that are indefeasible under any circumstances. Um, even if one could express the view that some kind of uh, values um, an absolute, 
that will still leave open a very big question, which is, well, um, how is this value to be interpreted? How is it to be understood? Um, what counts as um, an upholding of that value? What counts as a, a failure to, to honor that value? Uh, I mean, if you say freedom is a value, what counts then as a restriction on freedom? Um, you know, all of these things are difficult to settle. So to say that anything is an absolute, um, unconditionally um, to be valued, I think is impossible. So in that sense, my answer to your question of what is the value of values, well, you know, all values are defeasible. And all values um, are, to some extent, in tension with one another. And very often, you cannot um, honor uh, one value without compromising another. So this is, you know, this is what life is like. Yeah. Okay. So, turning though to your question about whether um, um, an iron fist might be you know, more useful sometimes than uh, having, say, uh, a less um, uh, forceful form of government. Well, I guess in principle, that may be true if you have the right person doing the right thing, okay, and that person is incorruptible and all-knowing. Okay. So if you want to say, wouldn't it be better to have God running things? You know, given the definition of God, it's very hard to say, well, no. Okay. Um, so if God stands for election, I think I'd vote for him. Okay. Um, and in fact, even if he comes along and says, uh, Look, I'm not going to stand for election. I'm just going to rule from now. Okay, but of course, you know, in real life, that's not the way things are. So, and of course, you can have better and worse rulers. You can have um, more and less um, intelligent, insightful, corruptible rulers. But I think, you know, over the course of history, we've become pretty suspicious of rulers. You know, partly because um, very few people can be uh, trusted either for their intelligence or for their integrity before they enter politics. But the second thing is that it's very, very rare to enter politics and then not be corrupted by it, not be corrupted by power. You, you know the famous line from Lord Acton that uh, power, all power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Um, well, this is a very dangerous thing. So, uh, on the whole, no matter who is going to be given power, I think it would be you know, dangerous and unwise to um, give them too much, even with its Gandhi uh, or uh, Moses. Um, they will be subject to that, that temptation. Higher power does tend to find you. And if you want an ex um, explanation, we can the rings. <laughs> so a quick question. Um, referring back again to the notion of living and let live, and then the idea of resources again, in a liberal society, to what extent should a liberal society approach the notion of live and let live? Merely toleration, which is just let them each subset of the society do their own thing, regardless of their resources and ability to do so or to actively facilitate their ability to live the way that they want to. Mm -hmm. And if it's the latter, what if, for instance, in the provision of public goods, for instance, the equality of access to public goods, this requires other communities from living, their, the, way, from living the way they want to in order to facilitate those? Well, this is you know, an ongoing debate amongst uh, liberals. And you can, I guess, say that, roughly speaking, there are uh, two extremes. Okay, one is saying, you know, live and let live meaning means let. It means not um, uh, preventing, but it also means not helping or subsidizing and so on. Um, and the other view tends more to say, well, okay, let's put the emphasis on live. So they've got to be somehow given the facilities and the resources and so on. Complications arise when, let's say, among other things, some ways of living may require resources 
that others don't want to give up. I mean, supposing, for example, my way of living requires that I have a yacht uh, and one for each member of my family. Well, the other members of the community might say, well, look, you know, I don't care that you want a yacht. If you want a yacht, you get your own yacht. Um, live and let live does not mean that I need to subsidize this. Okay, so these are the two extremes. Where do we find the balance? My view tends towards the, the minimalist view because I'm wary of giving any kind of um, authority and resources to a central authority that's then in the business of distributing. Because once they do that, they're going to have to make some judgments about what kinds of ways of living count. They're obviously going to say, no, ways of living that include requirements for a yacht don't count. Okay. But they could also say, no, 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 ways of living that require you to use traditional Chinese medicine don't count. That's not real medicine. Okay. Ways of living that include uh, this kind of religious practice don't really count. You, know, you don't really need a church. You don't really need a mosque. You want to pray, God will hear you. So, you know, no resources for you. Those are the kinds of, uh, you know, uh, conflicts that you're going to get into. So the distribution will end up, I think, being much more political. But okay, this is just uh, to, to outline the two kinds of perspectives. It's not going to give you a definitive answer because this is going to require you know, probably more time uh, than I've got. I mean, there are some people, for example, who argue that, yes, yeah, this is a problem, you know, uh, so what we should do is just give everyone a basic income. No, there's a lot to be, to be said for this. I mean, there are you know, arguments made by Marxists for basic income. There are arguments made by libertarians for a basic income. I mean, Milton Friedman, for example, proposed it um, 50 years ago. But there are also all kinds of problems associated with, with this. So uh, some way in that spectrum is, you know, um, is a plausible position that different liberals hold you know, different views on this. And, I think for me, um, uh, even though I want to push towards one end of the spectrum, I don't think that you know it's a disaster necessarily if there are um, intermediate steps that you know, society has adopted. That we need to be wary about you know, um, the dangers that come with uh, all kinds of political institutions. So where is? The role of equality in all of this should we be should this liberal society be aiming for equality, or should it be aiming towards equilibrium, at the sac at the risk of sacrificing equality, or am I just assuming erroneously that the two are mutually exclusive? Um, well, if you're talking about equality, the first thing you've got to ask is what are the relevant equalities that you're concerned about? Okay. Equality of what? or put it in a different set of terms, which equalities matter. Because equality is something that you can pursue along a lot of different dimensions. You can pursue equality of wealth, you can pursue equality of income, you can, you can pursue equality of status. Um, you, know, you, could have, you could pursue equality of all of these things at the individual level, so all individuals say have the same income or you could pursue equality at the level of the group, or make sure all groups are equal. So that the biggest group is equal to the smallest group. That's going to have a different sort of impact on the level of individual equality, depending on the size of the group. Okay, if you've got a very rich group with very few people, each individual will be very rich. Okay. If you've got a very large uh, group with a lot of people, um, but um, uh, another group which is um, very, very large, but has, uh, you know, and, and they both have individuals who are equal. Well, maybe then you'll get exact equality, but all groups are not the same size. So do you want group equality or do you want individual equality? Okay, I mean, all of these things have to be, uh, to be considered. For me, it means that equality is something that you should be very wary of pursuing as an end, you know, as an outcome. Now, I think equality before the law is very, very important. That, um, that equality uh, is an important consideration in, in that respect. But to try to equalize people in other respects is more problematic. I think for lots of egalitarians, actually, what's um, to be pursued is not 
some kind of perfect equalization or even imperfect equalization. What many of them are really interested in is, and this is where Rawls is an example, raising the, the, the welfare uh, of, the, of the worst off, uh, or raising the, the minimum uh, or the floor. Even then, it's of course complicated to decide. We're talking in terms of wealth, we're talking in terms of income, and what, what, is the, what is the metric? So I don't want to dismiss the idea of equality, but I think that there are very serious limitations to the, to the pursuit of it. One final question before I stop hogging the questions. At the risk of sounding too general and asking something that's probably obvious and basic, I think the general idea that's emerged from all the previous discussions is that there's a, there are different ways, liberal or otherwise, to organize society to be efficient and to live in equilibrium. So why choose, why a liberal theory over others, or more specifically, why your notion that you're advancing a political, political theory? Um, really because um, of precisely the thing that you described. There's, there are a lot of different views out there. Mm. There are lots of different ways. And if they all actually kept to themselves, and everyone was uh, happy in those uh, conditions, then fine. Um, but in fact, what you've got is a world in which all these different people actually want to live in association with one another, in interaction with one another in some way. And then you've got to ask, well, okay, uh, how do we associate, given that we, uh, to put in a slightly different way, given that we all worship different gods, okay, um, and we can't all just go separately, we don't all want to go separately then we need some kinds of uh, terms by which to interact. And that's where I think you know, the liberal ideal comes to the fore as an important kind of answer. Not because it answers a fundamental question about how one should live, but really because it answers the question, what do we do when people have different views about how we should live and yet want to live together? Mm -hmm. Just a quick follow-on question to Ian's question. Um, so the liberal ideal is 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 has appeal because it offers us a solution to this plurality of views, mm -hmm. and your liberal ideal is particularly minimalistic. So, in relation to for example, the Rawlsian uh, difference principle, um, your conception of liberalism is particularly minimalistic in the sense that it doesn't include a principle that governs the distribution of resources like those, like Rawls's difference principle. Why doesn't your view, why does your view exclude such a principle? I mean... Well, at the most what? general level, it, it excludes this, it because I don't want to think about liberalism as a principle or uh, as an ideal to be understood within a single society, especially within a single state. I want to think of it as something which describes the interaction of people who associate with one another across uh, all kinds of political boundaries. Okay. Society does not stop at the boundaries of the state. Uh, liberalism is not a doctrine of the state. Now, in the history of liberal theorizing, there have been times, and Rawls is an example of this, when we have tried to theorize in exactly this way, to think about liberalism in terms of the state. Um, and what I want to do is to resist that. But if you do, and, you, and if you broaden the scope of liberalism, it becomes very difficult to have a privilege principle, or indeed any distributive principle, because a distributive principle is going to have to depend upon the willingness of everyone within the society to accept that distribution, uh, to accept that, that outcome. I think Rawls saw this um, and realized that this meant that this, this um, theory could only be one that's confined to a specific context, the American, the American state. Okay? If, if you wanted to generalize across the globe, it would not be possible. And in fact, many theorists have said, well, this is one of the reasons why um, <coughs> you've got to think about the nation state, because if you think that 
distributive justice is the important thing, then you've got to confine it. Different societies will have their own uh, principles of justice and, and look after their own communities first. To me, this is um, an unattractive way of looking at things because, firstly, people do actually associate across the world. They do want to move back and forth between different countries. Um, and um, to try to confine them within a particular context, I think, um, in the end, encourages people to just look after their own when, in fact, there are many people out there in the world whose circumstances are actually pretty poor uh, and who therefore seem to get excluded and marginalized. I think the, the further consequence of this is on international political institutions that just protect the interests of you know, the most well-off countries, throwing some crumbs to those who are poor off. So I think you know, uh, for a liberal like me, thinking about liberalism in these terms is to think internationally about society as a larger realm of cooperation than just what's possible um, with the state. But yeah. don't you think the difference principle can be applied internationally as well? No. 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 Uh, for the reasons I think that Rawls saw, uh, and that is that um, it would require everyone uh, accepting this principle. So the principle says that um, once the basic liberties have been protected, um, these are liberties of various kinds, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, and so on. Um, resources should be distributed in such a way so as to um, improve the condition, or raise the condition of the worst of members of society. So by implication, there will be some kind of redistribution from, let's just say, to be simple, from rich to poor. Now, one reason why people might be willing to accept that redistribution is that they think that poor are, are their poor, they're, they're, they're part of us. I'd be willing to redistribute as a Malaysian to other Malaysians, but I'm certainly not going to distribute a penny to Singaporeans, yeah. right? Okay, that's the way they make it. Or Singaporeans, I feel precisely that. Um, maybe you're probably are, are aware of um, the Eurozone crisis of the past few years, uh, a crisis that's arisen because um, you've had a common currency, but with a single uh, interest rate that therefore also applied right across the, uh, the Eurozone, despite the fact that um, different countries had very different levels of productivity, and so this was not a, a, an arrangement that suited, say, a country like Greece as much as it did about Germany. Now, if this is in trouble, Germans are being asked to bail out the Greeks. This is what the Greeks are asking. Well, most Germans say, no, they're Greeks. They should take care of their own problems. Well, if you can't manage this just within something like a Eurozone, um, you know, among European countries, how are you going to manage this across the entire globe? Are you really going to get people in Norway saying, yes, we're willing to give up you know, large chunks of what we have to um, countries in Southeast Asia, for example. And I think most of the theorists of justice said, yes, that is going to be a real problem. How do you resolve this problem? Um, so there are theories of international rather global justice that try to figure out ways of establishing institutions of this kind. But the big problem they've got is established institutions that have some kind of legitimacy. So this is why I think uh, actually a better way to go is not to try to think about these sorts of global institutions. There are other reasons too, which is that I'm very, very skeptical about the likelihood that any of these institutions will in fact serve the poor because they will require interests of their own. And if you want uh, evidence of this, just look at the way the United Nations is going. Yeah. Yeah. Any more questions? If there aren't, could I just ask, yeah, sure. it's a total deviation from this. I, I just wanted to go back to a point that you made right, made right at the beginning. Um, you said something along the lines of, you, if you want to look at a society like Malaysia, for example, let's just ask questions like, 
you know, do we want to live together? How should we live together? As opposed to looking at um, the, the theory of justice, you know, uh, put forward by Rawls, for example. So I suppose my question is, um, what what would be the point of studying various theories and um, philosophers, for example, uh, if if that were, you know, if well, for one thing, to figure out why they're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but even philosophers who don't get it right, and I think you know, no one really gets it right to the extent that he's trying to come up with a blueprint. Um, the smartest of these people do, in fact, have important insights to offer. I think there's much you can learn. Um, but no society is really built by turning to a philosopher for for guidance. Um, now, many people have tried this, and there are many philosophers who have had a lot of um, <coughs> practical influence. I mean, Jeremy Bentham, for example, is very, very influential in various parts of the world, South America in particular, and the constitutions were were written under his uh, influence. Uh, penitentiaries were built because of his theories and so on. So some of them um, um, aren't often influential. But on the whole, I think their contribution is not really by supplying um, a set of tools you can pick up and use. Uh, they make a contribution really by helping you understand the nature of the world a little bit better. And sometimes they do it because they have true things to say. Very often they have something to contribute because they make the right mistakes. I suppose, um, you know, then therefore looking at, um, you know, uh, educa the higher <coughs> education, um, in terms of whenever, you know, I did my master's I and mean, I'm going to do my PhD, often before you produce, uh, you know, when you have to have a plan and, you know, a theoretic frame, framework is often demanded. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's why, I suppose, my question is, where is the place of that theoretical framework? Because often theoretical frameworks have to be based on studying various theories and using that theoretical framework and applying it to particular contexts. Yeah. Well, to take the example of, uh, of writing a PhD, for example, and what you start off trying to figure out is, what is the question that you're trying to address? What is the problem that you're trying to uh, deal with? Or what is the thing you're trying to explain or you know, account for, whether it's through um, um, a piece of argument or a piece of causal explanation or a kind of narrative? What's, what's the problem you're trying to address? And then when you've got an idea of that, you ask yourself, well, OK, um, what is the kind of theoretical framework that I want in the sense of um, what are the kinds of um, organizing concepts would best help me trying to address this question? And here it becomes useful to, to look to uh, political philosophers, other social theorists, to see what they've got to contribute. I think very often people say, well, OK, I'm going to just take the laws in framework. I'm going to take a Marxist approach. I don't think there's anything wrong with that in principle, but I think the danger is that you end up um, assuming that using a ready-made framework is in fact the best mm -hmm. thing to do, but in fact what you need to do ultimately is, is modify it, uh, because everything does depend on your question, what is the problem that you're trying to address. Um, and I think very often what happens is that you know, people take uh, an off-the-shelf, uh, you know, ready-to-wear framework and then find, well, no, actually what they, what they end up doing is offering something that is a critique of the framework itself as they, you know, through their own yeah. investigations, understand the detail a bit more concretely. Thank you. Well, do you guys have any? Any points of views to share on the value of philosophy? Yeah, uh, pushing on to the question of global justice, which you mentioned it just now. Uh, if we look at the Rosian idea of global justice, it's very pessimistic. And uh, mm -hmm. no, I am not convinced with uh, Rawls' argument in the law of peoples, mm -hmm. uh, in particular, uh, because it focuses on making domestic societies to be uh, decently just and liberal societies. So he seems to neglect there is a network 
of uh, a global structure of cooperation, which uh, has been argued by his student uh, Thomas Poggi. So, uh, look, looking at this kind of uh, distribution uh, in a global network of, as we mentioned just now, global capitalism, uh, how would you see the question of global justice? Is it, is, is it like uh, we have arrived at an impossible impasse, or we still have hope to uh, for, for new breakthroughs? Because it seems like in the analytical tradition at least, we are debating whether the rich uh, whether they have duties to help the poor outside of their uh, geographical boundaries? Well, this is a very, very big question, uh, and there's an enormous uh, uh, literature and debate on this. I, uh, I can give you my, my, my general view, but I can't defend it in, uh, in a few minutes. So my, my general view is very skeptical about the whole uh, global justice um, aspiration. Uh, not because I think you know, people cannot have duties across boundaries, if anything, quite the reverse. I don't think we should be thinking in terms of boundaries. But um, my own thinking is that to establish institutions of global justice re-establishes one of the problems that we've got, which is that with all political institutions, what you get is the politicization of those institutions. Institutions don't really solve the problem of politics. They're realms in which political conflicts uh, and political interests you know, reconvene, as it were. And if you do this at the global level, my concern is that the, the sums involved, the money involved, is so great that it can only attract um, rent seekers. And the ones who will gain from this are those who are best adept at extracting those rents. Okay. So I think this is almost an insoluble problem uh, of political institutions generally, but maybe even more so with global political institutions. Now, this isn't to say that therefore we should just you know, not think at all about how we might improve the lot of people um, around the world. Um, my own view is one of the best things that we can do is actually to open up the borders um, of, uh, of states so that people can move freely, so there's a greater global mobility of labor. You know, it took a long time to um, establish the, the mobility of capital as an important principle. We now have you know, pretty free movement of money, resources around the world. But people are so confined, um, so I think this would be one or one very important mechanism for um, you know, bringing about global change without establishing some kind of uh, global regime or some kind of you know, global trust fund in the way that Thomas Bobby has suggested, for example. I, mean, I think those are the things, that the, the solutions that I'm more skeptical of. But as I said, I can't really defend this you know, completely now because it's not that those advocates in those positions don't have other kinds of responses to this. Uh, so it is a big debate. So in a way you are advocating for some kind of uh, a free market, uh, I mean... Well, it's a free market, but actually more specifically it's a free society. And, and I think one shouldn't equate the two things. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's some, you know, in the 20th century, a long um, period uh, in which socialism and communism were thought to be the, uh, the solutions to you know, the human condition. And in the advance of those ideas, the idea of a free market was not just rejected, it was ridiculed and disparaged. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the advocates of the market um, you know, made great claims, and I think very important claims, about the uh, importance of markets. And I, and I think they were right about this. But a free market is not a free society, because a society is not just a market. People don't just relate to one another in economic terms, in terms of uh, you know, buying and selling or trading. They also relate to one another in all kinds of other ways. Um, so a free society is, I think, the important thing. A free market is an aspect of this. But freedom of movement, for example, is not a market freedom, because you may be moving not just to get a job um, or to um, you know, 
several business, you may be moving because you've fallen in love with someone. No reason. You always wanted to go to Salt Lake City. <laughs> uh, there may be all kinds of reasons that you want to, to move. And this can be you know, an important thing for the development uh, of societies, for the interaction of people, mm -hmm. you know, even if there are no economic uh, elements to it. So that, that's the way I would want to look at it, not um, as a line for free markets, but in a line for free societies. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Okay. Sorry, one quick oh, yeah. one. one Just thought yeah. about it. Um, it. It might probably be sorry. Might probably be completely unrelated to what was discussed beforehand. Sometimes in the discussions of patriotism and loyalty to the state, there's a distinction between the government as an entity separate from the state. So their loyalties might be with the state, the country itself. So whose loyalties may be with the state? Let's say, for instance, an individual citizen saying that yeah. I'm patriotic yeah. myself because I love my country. My arguments are with the state, or with the state's government, not the state itself. How legitimate is this distinction, given that in certain democratic countries, for instance, it's the people who chose the governing body, the state, government? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm generally very unsympathetic to patriotism. Uh, whether it's to the state or the government, but especially it's to the government, because first, governments tend to say that, uh, that they are the state. And not always in so many words, but very, very often. And uh, I think um, you should just treat that with suspicion, <laughs> not contempt. Um, when it comes to loyalty to the state, um, my worry is that uh, Ultimately, it means elevating something which is really an abstraction. Uh, and I want to ask, why uh, are you wanting to invest so much in this abstraction? If you care about other human beings, that seems to be fine. You can do that without expressing this through this um, mechanism. If you care about others collectively, you can still um, do this without expressing something like a loyalty to the state. Um, you know, I think there are all kinds of ways of, in fact, attending to um, the interests and concerns of a large group of people even, without um, appealing to these political institutions, these political entities. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my attitude. That's not a, a, an argument or a defense, but it just tells you where I stand. Okay, um, that brings us to the end of our, of our discussion. Uh, firstly, I would ask everyone to give a round of applause. <laughs> this Friday afternoon spends time with us. And of course, uh, also to the panelists who have spoken this morning. I mean, you guys have probably given them a round of applause already. But <laughs> just one minute. And thank you all for coming. I think some of my questions weren't um, very